The United States and Japan have a unique symbiotic relationship centered around an exchange of entertainment, popular culture, and their associated artifacts. Despite their history as bitter rivals during World War II, which ended less than 75 years ago, trade deals, economic markets, and consumer demand from each country sustains a steady flow of fashion, music, uh, food trends, films, television, animation, and video games across the Pacific Ocean in both directions. And while video games and their music make a profound impact on the dominant pop cultures of both countries, they also exert influence both uh, also in, in more traditional institutions, which uh, Will talked about this morning, uh, such as the Western Symphonic Orchestras and that now play, video concert, or play concerts of video games music, for example. Video games also have a significant influence on other minority and non-Western cultures and subcultures. Video game fans among these groups that fall outside the dominant culture of the US and Japan have claimed video game music as their own through the performance of its music in online cover videos, um, in the rap music that we listened to earlier, um, and on instruments and in, in ensembles uh, unique to their specific culture. And so what I thought I would do now is just pause for a second and show you some examples that I'll refer to for the rest of the talk today. Um, so this is my jam back in, um, in the early 90s. This is the moon theme from DuckTales. I think that date is wrong, actually. I think it's uh, late 80s. All right, and here's a cover video um, played by uh, uh, a San Antonio-based ensemble called Mariachi Entertainment System. There we go. And uh, mariachi uh, music and tequila both come from the Mexican state of Jalisco. And so it makes a lot of sense that they would take tequila shots before every video. Pa arriba, pa abajo, pa el centro, pa dentro. I thought people would be familiar enough with the Legend of Zelda theme, um, but maybe not the Famicom startup sounds. <laughs> and so here is a video of Famicoto. We start with the Famicom sound, the music, and then play the Zelda theme.
So taking the work of groups such as Mariachi Entertainment Art System and Famicoto as examples, uh, my paper today examines the translation of video game, uh, video game music into non-Western and quote-unquote world music idioms um, as a form of fan labor. I'll consider some of the intersections and influences of video game music within various non-culture and quote-unquote ethnic contexts. And we'll discuss the exploration and expression of these influences through multicultural participation in video game music fandom as seen in online cover videos. I also want to reflect uh, on some of the ways in which these performances call into question themes of cultural appropriation, authenticity, and ownership. So in order to investigate the ways in which video game music becomes situated in non-Western contexts by global audiences, such as in videos like the ones we just watched, uh, we must first take a look at the ways in which global audiences are built. How do we interface with other cultures in their media artifacts? And how do audiences make the decision to consume media and cultural products from their own culture or from another culture? British, so British sociologist Anthony Giddens defines globalization as, quote, the intensification of worldwide social relations which links distant local localities uh, in such a way that local happenings are shaped by events occurring many miles away and vice versa. Uh, through ever through a, an ever-quickening increase in the transfer of ideas, money, and culture, the world is becoming a smaller place. Of the various models and paradigms I want to use to understand the various forms of globalization and global audience building that I want to address today, uh, the first is through cultural imperialism, uh, or the understanding that there is a heavy imbalance between cultures and audiences, with most audiovisual content flowing from the developed world, namely the United States, uh, to global audiences. Cultural imperialism is most evident in the United States' post-war influence in Japan in the 1940s and much of the remaining 20th century. After the US dropped two atomic bombs on Japan in August 1945, killing hundreds of thousands of Japanese citizens and effectively ending World War II, the US occupied Japan until 1952, rebuilding the former Japanese empire as an American-styled constitutional democracy, instituting New Deal economic policies, labor rights, and educational reforms. The so-called Americanization of Japan and Japanese culture was far from a reciprocal relationship. And although there were many mid-century cultural imports from Japan, the United States exerted far more cultural influence on Japan than Japan exerted on the US. The American military presented itself as an overwhelming source of authority that forcefully exerted influence over virtually every facet of Japanese life, including the consumption of popular culture. Western cultural values of individualism and consumerism took hold in Japan and elsewhere across the developing world, and many feared that audiences would become homogenized as they consumed the same media, especially considering the fact that a smaller, small number of sources produced the largest amount of content, largely credited with a comparatively high production value and a powerful distribution apparatus. Evidence of America's influence can be heard in video game music that employs Western pop idioms, such as the ragtime in uh, Koji Kondo's ground theme for uh, Super Mario Brothers, for example. Alternatively, proponents of the cultural proximity theory argue that when a choice is offered, audiences tend to choose culturally proximate content. That is, quote, media products from one's own culture or the most similar possible culture, end quote. In this model, media artifacts are more successful on a global scale if the cultural distance between importing and exporting countries is low. Cultural proximity privileges cultural structures, such as the languages people speak or their national and regional identities, and uh, strengthens the argument that both factors contribute to cultural consumption on a global scale. For example, Mexican immigrants in the United States might prefer Spanish language telenovelas produced it in Argentina over American soap operas. Although it's easy to argue that cultural imperialism and cultural proximity play a role in the ways in which video game music becomes part of a particular culture, these paradigms tend to focus on the producers and transmitter of the cultural ideas or artifacts and on the negative effects its hegemonic power has on the receiving culture. Perhaps more pertinent to the videos at hand are concepts such as absorption and indigenization, recontextualization or glocalization, which shift attention from the producing culture to the perspective of the receiving party. Discussing a music television in India, Vamsi Juluri writes, quote, it would seem, therefore, that the study of globalization in media needs to turn its attention to the media audience, not merely as a commercially constructed aggregate of viewers or particularly disem disembodied subject of global modernity, 
but as the point at which media are made meaningful and effectivized, end quote. It is worth noting that much of the power of a media artifact lies in the interpretation of the audience that receives it. And thanks in part to YouTube and other democratizing audiences in uh, advances in media technology, this audience now has the power to adapt, translate, or otherwise transform these artifacts to be even more meaningful to them from their cultural perspective. Writing about adaptations of American film and television in Hong Kong, communication scholar Paul S. N. Lee describes four patterns of absorption and indigenization of foreign cultural materials and media using zoological metaphors. Uh, the first one is the parrot pattern. And this is a wholesale adaption of foreign cultural forms and contents, much like a parrot imitating the human voice in both form and content without even comprehending the meaning of the utterance. Uh, the amoeba pattern, this pattern keeps the content but changes the form, just like an amoeba which appears different in form but remains uh, the same in substance at all times. The coral pattern, uh, this pattern is the opposite of the amoeba pattern in that it keeps the form but changes the content, just like the coral which maintains the coral shape after it has died, although its substance has already changed. And the last is the butterfly pattern, so just as a butterfly is the result of a transformation from a completely different larval form, in this pattern, a culture absorbs and indigenizes foreign cultures to an extent that one can hardly distinguish the foreign from the indigenous. Both the original form and the content of foreign cultures cannot be distinguished easily from the local. In the case of both the Mariachi Entertainment System's cover of the moon theme from DuckTales and Famicoto's cover of the theme from The Legend of Zelda, I argue that both would be examples of the amoeba pattern, at least at the surface level. In these videos, the arrangers seem to indigenize the video game music by absorbing the musical material, keeping the melodic and harmonic content mostly constant, but changing their form. Uh, not in the musical form sense, but in the form of the performing ensemble, exchanging 8-bit waveforms for traditional, ethnographically specific instruments. On another level, though, this music was, in a way, already indigenous to the performing ensembles. Ortiz and his mariachis share a common Latin American heritage, but are all Americans, or at least residents of the United States, living in the San Antonio, Austin, uh, Texas metro area. So the DuckTales theme isn't necessarily foreign to them, and I wager that it would, just, it would fit just as well within most American musical, musical idioms, as well as it does within the mariachi idiom as many other cover videos on YouTube would attest. Likewise, Kondo and his theme to The Legend of Zelda, Zelda is native to Japan, but in this case, the music is transferred or transculturated from an arguably westernized, if not explicitly Americanized, Japanese popular culture into traditional Japanese idiom. Audiences filter their experience of various media, media through their own cultural and their individual perspectives and as a result, interpret the same content in very different ways. These interpretations are reflections of their own cultural identity. These interpretations can also raise issues of cultural exchange, appreciation, and or appropriation. In instances of cultural exchange, members of different cultures are invited to participate in a reciprocal exchange of art, ideas, etc. Cultural appreciation is a one-sided version of cultural exchange wherein cultural artifacts are appreciated with an understanding of and respect for their significance to the culture from which they come. Cultural appropriation is the use of elements from one culture by members of another culture, but this usually refers to the adoption and commodification of cultural ideas and artifacts from a marginalized group of others, considered in some way unequal by members of a dominant or privileged culture. Because cultural appropriation is a byproduct of hegemonic oppression, there's an exploitive power dynamic at work in the appropriative act, wherein the dominant culture capitalizes on, takes credit for, and or profits from the culture of subaltern communities. This often happens with little or no understanding or respect for the culture being exploited and tends to perpetuate stereotypes, ignorance, and insensitivity. Cultural appropriation is often damaging, traumatizing, and is a form of symbolic violence against marginalized people and cultures. Because of their position in this power dynamic, marginalized communities cannot participate in the exploitative appropriation process. Any act that seems appropriative is instead an act of assimilation with or resistance against the dominant culture. 
I believe that absorption and indigenization mentioned previously are examples of this assimilation, assimilation or resistance. So thinking about our examples in these terms raises many questions. For example, aren't all instances of fan labor, such as cover videos like these, examples of video game cultural appropriation on some level? Uh, can cover videos of video game music truly be culturally appropriative, especially when members of a marginalized Western culture appropriate or borrow cultural artifacts from an Eastern culture? Are Japanese video game companies uh, which produce games and commission music for these games truly an integral part of Eastern culture? Or are they vestiges of Western capitalism that happen to operate in the East? These also lead to an even bigger question. Who owns video game culture? Who is part of it and how does one become part of it? As little musicologists with rather extensive formal music training, I think we're especially skilled in navigating the polysemic nature of music in general and video game music in particular. And as more ludomusicological research explores the issue of identity, cultural context, political economy, and social practice, or ethno-ludomusicology, if you will, and I hate to be that guy, um, uh, but I think many examples of what we've seen this weekend um, prove that our historical understanding and analysis of video game music will be all the more richer, taking that perspective. Thank you, Michael, for that paper. We have about eight or nine minutes for questions, so we have some up here. If we could throw the cube, perhaps, in this direction, or if it happens to be close. Very good. And we'll send it back. Yeah, hi. I, uh, I enjoyed your talk. As an ethnomusicologist, that's um, one of the things that uh, I was thinking about when I came to this conference is, you know, the, the cultural aspect of video games. And so um, the idea of appropriation is a really slippery word to use in ethnomusicology. Um, we tend not to use it because um, traditions aren't fixed. Globalization isn't new. Um, there is no musical genre in the world that hasn't been touched by another culture. Um, so it's a difficult thing to kind of go with that term. Is there? Is there any other, can you see any other way around of, you know, avoiding that term? Because it's, it's loaded, it's just so loaded. It is really loaded. Um, I think the only time that I really use appropriation in this sort of context is, you know, to describe that power dynamic when it's sort of being as an exploitive kind of thing and people are commodifying music in that way. Mm -hmm. And so it's why, I'd, for the title of the paper, I really lean toward um, transculturation um, so that, you know, rather than being an enculturation where you sort of force your culture on someone else or deculturalization where you sort of take it away, that this transculturation is sort of a transformative thing and that you know, the mixing of culture and cultural elements or cultural influences sort of creates a whole nother thing rather than taking from or adding to what was already there. Yeah, another term that we use a lot in ethnomusicology is just that the music is you know, it's, it's syncretic. Yeah. We talk about a lot about syncretism as well. But yeah, thanks for yeah, that. Thank you very much. So I have a question about sort of, I guess, the, so, the socially constructed borders. Um, I was uh, a, I'm a bit confused when you first brought a traditional Japanese ensemble and comparing it with um, what I thought to be a traditionally Japanese game um, and juxtaposing the two cultures. Um, and you know, then you went into the um, Japanese history with the Westernization being forced onto them, so um, which I understood. But so my question is, um, what about cases where that line is a bit less clear? Um, there are many cultures today who would um, who create products that would seem pretty Western, um, and then. So mimic that in uh, their own tradition as well. Um, 
And how would you determine whether that's a different culture or not, whether that's going from one, uh, an Americanized version, of, but still the same culture, um, to uh, indigenizing it um, still within that same culture? I don't know if that's making much sense, but. I think I understand what you're asking. Yeah. Um, and I think it's somewhere that I really wouldn't want to go. You know, and it's, it's especially being a, a white man, I, I feel like that there's, there's a lot of places that I don't need to stick my nose and that my opinion or my voice or my scholarly position has little um, place, you know, in sort of determining here's your culture, here's mine. You know, here's where I draw the line and I hope you like that or not. Um, but I, I, I do think that, you know, sort of what we talked about a second ago, that um, when you talk about cultural influences uh, rather than cultural differences and sort of the ways that the cultures interact or intersect or borrow from one another rather than how they're so different or how they're, you know, uh, where they diverge, it's probably a more fruitful place to start looking into those sorts of things. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry if that didn't. No, that's, yes, sir, um, I mean, it's fair enough. Yeah. Hi, so I've never really con thought about, you know, st stuff like this in a sense of appropriation before, so thank you for sort of bringing that to me. Um, I, think, I've, I think it's interesting because that, that DuckTales game co comes from, you know, Japan, but DuckTales, is an American franchise too. So I guess at what point exactly does it become appropriation versus transculturation? Is it a motivic thing? Is it, is it motive based or? That's a good question um, <laughs> that I really don't know the answer to. Um, and a lot of what, um, you know, I was talking about that in order you know, for something to be actually appropriation, you know, that, that, that term comes from sociology and archaeology when people would take artifacts from another culture to put it in their museum, you know, in London or Washington, D.C., um, without really paying respect to the culture from which it comes. And obviously, if you take it from a grave or whatever, there's really a lot of respect being left, you know, right. on the wayside. Um, and so in this case, you know, it's kind of tricky because on the one hand, Disney is like this global media conglomerate you know, now that there's like a Disneyland in Tokyo and, you know, that sort of thing that, you know, that, that hegemonic economic power has sort of spread to the east. But then on the other hand, a, a Capcom and a Japanese company is employing people and making money selling Disney stuff back to America. You know, and so it, it gets kind of weird and I understand there's a lot of reasons why people would shy away from yeah. labeling things as appropriate or not. Um, okay, thank you. Almost. Um, so I think this is really interesting, and this is another one of my half-baked questions, but um, you know, when I, I see the mariachi Mario, I can't help but think of the Super Mario Odyssey uh, mariachi Mario. And, game, and, and, and that game and other games like that in which um, kind of pseudo world music uh, is, is a part of the kind of mechanics of an open world game in which you're sort of exploring different cultures in a game. And so certain types of ex sort of pseudo exotic or weird ethnic mixes in like desert worlds have certain like Middle Eastern kind of flavors. So yeah. it's like these kinds of, so and this and and so there's like kind of like that that's a really sort of strong tradition really in games, but then taking those kind of themes out and um, is, is there a way in which some of this is kind of like also sort of reclaiming a bit of like cultural agency or some sort of musical agency over um, a kind of hegemonic 
uh, video game industry, or is that is that just like going way too far? <laughs> no, I think I, maybe not these videos in particular, but I'm sure there are examples. You know that some you know people may claim, you know, like maybe for example, if this Mariachi Entertainment System decided that they wanted to take the song from Mario Odyssey and say this isn't Coachella, you can't just wear a sombrero, and then make a mariachi cover of the mariachi piece from the from the game, then you know that would be, you know, the reclamation sort of indigenation kind of thing. Um, but I don't, and if generally I don't know if that's really the same. It um, brings up a good, um, the last chapter of Anit Kasabian, I always butcher her name when I say it, um, but the book, Yupiko Just Listening, there's a uh, copy at the end, of uh, the chapter at the end called, um, Would You Like Some World Music With Your Latte? It talks about how <laughs> Starbucks plays all this world music that's ethnic, whatever that means, you know, um, and sort of it's just a commodity rather than an actual thing, and so that any chance that uh, marginalized groups have to, you know, reclaim their cultural heritage or, you know, that sort of thing yeah. that we should support and celebrate and lift up and Thank do what you. we can yeah. help that happen.